So hi everyone, I'm Shihan, I'm uh, a PhD student in the Technology Lab in uh, Tel Aviv University. And uh, my presentation today is about a project I published about two years ago. Um, and I'm going to show, to show it to you step by step. Um, so ever since uh, humans have discovered that genes are the uh, um, are responsible of our function of how we act, how we look, what we do. Uh, so the uh, the goal or the dream was to to alter the genes or edit them in order to create the perfect human being. So here, what we see, we can design a baby that would have um, a perfect speech, wouldn't be bold, have high IQ low risk of all diseases, 20-20 uh, vision, and uh, the main thing that he'll be a sprinter. And uh, a few years ago, CRISPR has emerged into our, into our lives and um, gave uh, like a promise to fulfill this dream. Um, ever since CRISPR has emerged, then we hear some uh, titles like Scientists have eliminated HIV in mice using CRISPR. CRISPR is going to revolutionize our food system. Cancer cure close. Gene editing therapy could cure cancer and all inherited diseases in the next 20 years. And the genetic breakthrough that could change humanity. You're What's all the fuss about? On Sorry, what? You have a CRISPR experiment on human in China lately. I'll go into it later. So what is CRISPR? Um, a short biology lesson. Um, I assume that you know the DNA in this form. It's a double helix, two strings um, against each other uh, in a helix. And if we stretch the DNA and zoom in, then we can see that uh, they are composed of, uh, actually, these are two strings that are built out of the four nucleotides that I may talk about. Uh, we can, uh, these are four molecules and uh, we represent them by the letter A, C, T, N, G. So each of the strings is composed of this letter A, C, T, N, G. And we can actually write each of the, string of the str strings in a, like a string character. And another thing we know about the DNA is that uh, we always have A against T and C against G. So if we know one string, then we can always tell what the other string is. It's always A, A against T and C against G. So we can, if we know one string, then we always know the other string. And this is how the DNA looks. Okay, so the DNA are two strings that are attached together. And we also have another molecule, which is called RNA. And RNA molecules are very similar to DNA, but they can stand on, on their own. Yeah, So RNA uh, molecules are strings, again, of A, C, D, and G. And, um, a, C, T, and G, and um, they can stand on, its, uh, on their own. They don't have to attach to a different molecule. Uh, one comment here is that actually RNAs are not composed of A, C, T, and G, but A, C, U, and G. But for this matter, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, for now, it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, RNA molecules can stand on their own, but they can al also bind to DNA molecules, A against T and uh, C against G, like in the DNA thing. Okay, so if we have um, an RNA molecule, and here what we see is the DNA, the double helix of the, of the DNA, and this RNA molecule, um, is similar to one of the DNA strands, then it can also bind to the other uh, to the other DNA strand. So if we can open the uh, the two the two strands of the DNA, 
then the RNA can uh, like in, uh, enter in instead of one of them and attach to it. And this is actually how the CRISPR works. So the CRISPR mechanism is actually uh, a protein, which is called the Cas9. It's this bluish uh, cloud over here. Uh, the Cas9 is the CRISPR protein, which carries a molecule of RNA. We call it sgRNA, single guided RNA. Um, in the, uh, we have two parts of the RNA. One part is the uh, is 20 nucleotides, 20 bases of ACPG um, that are supposed to be um, similar to the DNA target that we want uh, we want to um, we want to find. And the other part is just uh, a part of the machinery, and we uh, it doesn't matter to us. So um, again, what what uh, CRISPR has is this protein Cas9 and uh, the RNA, and uh, this is here the DNA, the, the black lines, and the ladder between them are the A against T and C against G. Um, and um, what happens is that CRISPR detects uh, three letters, uh, which are called TAM, TAM sequence. Uh, these are NGG, where N is a variable uh, position and it, it could be either A, C, T, or G. Uh, once CRISPR identifies this, it tries uh, it tries to uh, bind uh, the RNA to the DNA. And if uh, it uh, a detection was made, then um, CRISPR can function in this position. And how it works is so we talked about DNA and actually the DNA inside uh, the cells of our body is two meters long and it is folded to small little cells um, so um, and uh, in this big DNA that are uh, there are positions that are called genes and each gene is a composition of um, a, a substring of the large DNA string and it is translated into um, into functions into proteins like I might mention yeah, uh, earlier. So um, when uh, CRISPR is designed to target a gene, then um, we, uh, the scientist, has to design the RNA that CRISPR carries. And then what happens? Uh, once the scientist enters the CRISPR into the cell, it like passes over the whole DNA until it uh, detects the target that it's supposed to attach to. So uh, in this example, we have here uh, 10 nucleotides uh, instead of 20 nucleotides, just for the example. And um, there's a, touch, a detection between the RNA of the CRISPR to the DNA inside this gene. And afterwards, we have um, the time sequence, the NGG. And once this de detection has occurred, um, CRISPR, uh, um, CRISPR uh, acts another uh, function that is supposed to cleave this gene in this position. If uh, this succeeded, then we have what's called gene knockout, and the gene wouldn't function anymore. Okay? Now, just pay attention that um, I always talk about this RNA that binds to this DNA, but since uh, this is the complement uh, of this sequence, and this is the complement of this sequence, then this DNA strand is identical to this DNA strand. So from now on, I'll talk about the RNA uh, similarity to this, to the uh, DNA that is complement to what it attaches, attaches to. Holds DNA and separates the two strands here for this uh, Cas9 to work. It's like a the Cas9 does it. Process or Cas9 know to do all the things by itself without. Yes, the Cas9 the... knows how to open the two strands and bind the RNA. And also how to uh, unfold the histones or whatever. No, so it doesn't unfold the histones, so and so. and I'll get to that later. Uh, but no, it just scans the, the DNA and if it can, uh, DNA be, if it can attach to it. 
the DNA at this stage should not be uh, Back, no, 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 it should be open. Okay, so um, we have an, we have a system which is very easy to use, very specific, and very, very efficient. And this whole thing made a big fuss in the world. And just think about it. Um, what can you do with CRISPR? Uh, just for you to, uh, <laughs> to try to think of things, and then I'll just tell you that genes are, of many organisms are sequenced, annotated, and their functions are known. That means that uh, if you want to, uh, to study some genome, then you can probably find it online and even uh, find the genes inside it and, tell, and uh, look for them and find what they do, what their function is. So if you have all this knowledge and you also have CRISPR, and imagine for a minute that you walk into the lab and you can, uh, you can use CRISPR to stop a any gene that you want. What could you do if you had this, this ability? You can do with 100 different uh, things that you can choose from. Okay, so you can design a baby, that, that's true. Um, several examples, you can disrupt disease-causing genes. If you know that one gene is causing uh, a disease, uh, then you can target CRISPR exactly to the position of the uh, of the gene, stop it, and then stop the, the disease. Another thing, you can mimic disease models. If, for example, we want today to uh, study um, um, a breast tissue, uh, breast cancer tissue, and then and you know which gene is causing the um, the cancer then you can uh, design CRISPR to tackle that gene and then create the, uh, um, the cancer uh, cells in, in the lab. And another example is the reverse genetics. Uh, reverse genetics means that you can, um, you can do a knockout to a gene and then tell by its not uh, non-function, tell what it does. For example, if today I want, to, uh, I found a new gene in the tomatoes, and I can't find what it does online, um, then I'll, uh, I'll uh, prefer uh, I'll uh, target CRISPR to this gene in a seed of tomatoes, and I'll grow the bush. And after four months, I have tomatoes, and they all turn out green. Then what does this gene do? But that uh, but it's the color of red. Yes, but this is another issue. And um, when you have redundancy between genes, then it means sometimes that their uh, sequences are very similar. And if you uh, plan CRISPR according to a sequence, then you can stop all of them. So this is one advantage so of CRISPR. Not totally, totally specific. It is specific towards a sequence, not towards a gene. How specific towards the sequence? You have 20 nucleus, like all of them need to be the same, 18%, 18 needs to be the same. So we'll get to, uh, basically all of them need to be the same, but there are some false positives, and we'll get to it. So, um, once the, this CRISPR has a, it, it's actually changed our lives, um, then uh, we can see here the, the number of publications in every year uh, since its discovery. So in 2005, um, some scientists uh, found out that there is something in bacteria that uh, helps their, uh, uh, their immune system. And since then, since then, it has been studied until 2012, when the uh, the CRISPR system has been fully uh, uh, identified. And in 2013, um, the system has been adjusted to uh, to be uh, to infect um, uh, more complex cells, more complex than bacteria, like human cells. And ever since then. Um, the research, the research of uh, CRISPR has increased dramatically until in 2018 uh, we had almost 
5,000 publications uh, of using CRISPR. And this whole class uh, got the name the CRISPR craze. It's a very easy system. You can do uh, basically whatever you want in your research with it. It's very efficient, very specific, but it doesn't have to be a perfect match. That means that I can uh, plan the sgRNA, the CRISPR, to target a sequence with A in here, but it would uh, cleave a target with C over here. And then there is <laughs> the CRISPR to target one sequence, one gene, but we have knockout in another gene. And actually, sorry. The probability of it is from the color of 19, so it needs to be really rare to have some. Let's continue and then maybe we'll get exactly what you um, In November, uh, November uh, 2018, Heiji and Kui, this uh, professor in China, he went up to the stage in a human genome editing conference, the Human Gen Genome Editing Summit in Hong Kong, and he said, I made CRISPR babies. What uh, Jin Kui did is uh, he um, targeted uh, a, a gene called CCR5 in uh, embryos of, uh, of birth uh, where the um, mother was, uh, was healthy and the father had uh, AJV, was an AJV carrier. And he wanted to make the babies resistant to, uh, to HIV. So, um, uh, Hedge and Kui did his experiment and, uh, and the embryos, uh, actually they, the babies were born and uh, last uh, September and uh, um, Hedge and Kui presented them on the stage and he said, these are uh, CRISPR babies that I designed. Um, now, after that, uh, there was a big fuss in the world. First of all, uh, who made you a god to design babies? And the second thing is, did you look for off targets of CRISPR? Did you check where CRISPR uh, cleaned uh, that is not where you targeted to? And he didn't uh, actually do that, and it's all his uh, it, it, this whole uh, thing is now being uh, uh, checked and he's uh, uh, currently he's in a uh, house arrest uh, in China. Okay, so ever since uh, this whole uh, CRISPR has um, it changed our lives and uh, people want to use it, but they found that uh, it can also target other genes, then they tried to, uh, to tell where CRISPR, where CRISPR would clip. So there were several uh, studies over the years. One of them, for example, from 2013 said that uh, there's a single base mismatch in the uh, 11 nucleotides that are close to the thumb and would, would um, prevent uh, CRISPR from cleaving this, uh, uh, this sequence. Uh, another one said that uh, there should be three or more mismatches between the DNA and the, and the RNA in order to prevent CRISPR for, from uh, functioning. And another one said that if that uh, there are two mismatches in the first story, there, there are mismatches in the two first nucleotides that are close to the thumb, then CRISPR won't cleave, but what about the rest? So we, have, we had overall many studies and each of them came to different conclusions. And then there was uh, some other studies that did genome-wide analysis uh, of CRISPR. What they did was um, they infected cells with CRISPR, uh, for example, with this RNA over here that they, des they designed. They infected the cells and then uh, they uh, passed over the DNA of all the cells and they wanted to detect which positions were clipped, were actually clipped by CRISPR. So what we see in this uh, table is here we have the genomic coordinates, uh, the exact coordinates over the DNA. Um, here we have the number of times CRISPR cleaved uh, this position out of the, uh, the whole cell culture. And in the, each row is a different, uh, a, a different target. 
uh, the dots represent matches to the RNA, between the DNA and the RNA. So here in the first line, we have the on target, which is uh, identical to the RNA. Uh, uh, this is the variable uh, position, the end, so it could be anything, but this is the on target. And the other targets, the other lines, are off target since we have uh, several mismatches uh, inside of them. Uh, for example, in the second line, in the second uh, sequence, we have two uh, mismatches between the RNA and the DNA, and it had a lower uh, cleavage frequency. And as we go down with the uh, cleavage frequency, we can see more mismatches, but we have here mismatches in the two first positions. We have in some of them more than three mismatches, and uh, we have, we sure have uh, mismatches in the first 11 nucleotides. So the conclusions that all the studies came up with uh, do not really hold when we look at whole genome uh, data. And um, the goal is actually when we want to uh, when we want to design the optimal CRISPR, we want to design uh, an sRNA sequence with high efficiency on the on-target side site and low efficiency on any other site, the off-targets, in order to have the min, uh, minimum of off-targets possible. So this is what I did in, in this project. I developed a machine learning al algorithm in order to study the probability for cleavage of uh, a DNA uh, sequence by an RNA sequence. Uh, the input to the algorithm is a pair of RNA and DNA, and uh, the output is the probability for cleavage. Actually, because we have um, machine learning here, then I can form this uh, probability of cleavage by composition of features from the DNA and RNA pair. Um, so uh, the data this algorithm is composed of uh, is taken from uh, genome-wide analysis, like the table I showed you before. Um, so we had uh, five studies that used three methods in order to detect this position all over the genome. And uh, these together make up uh, 32 RNAs, 32 CRISPR experiments, and about 700 targets that were cleaved. And since uh, these methods detect all of the targets that were cleaved in the genome, then any other target or possible target that wasn't clear, I can extract and say that it, I, sorry, I can extract it from the genome and say that it wasn't clear. So uh, I use bioinformatic algorithm, algorithms to go over the reference genome that we can, again, we can find it online and look for uh, sequences inside it. Uh, so I found all the targets that are, have some resemblance to the RNA but weren't clear. And these are the uncleaved sites. Uh, from the studies, I have the cleavage frequency, the right column in the table before. And from the, uh, the uncleaved sites, the ones that I extracted from the genome, I, uh, the uh, observed cleavage frequency is actually zero. From every pair of sgRNA and DNA, I can extract some features. Uh, the most obvious ones are the um, identity between the sgRNA and the DNA, but they have others which represent the sgRNA and how it folds, or the DNA and its stru structure. From all of these, I uh, used a random forest algorithm in order to compose the model to, uh, um, to predict, according to the features, the uh, observed cleavage frequency or actually the probability for cleavage. And I'll just go uh, into the algorithm for a few minutes. Um, and we'll start from the beginning. So imagine that we have only two features, uh, the uh, percent of similarity and the mismatch distance from the path. And we, st we have here uh, the, uh, the dots on the board are the uh, DNA and RNA pairs. And we have three colors, so these are the ones that were uh, cleaved in, with high frequency, and these are the ones with low uh, frequency, and these are with medium frequency. 
And we say that if we have high similarity and if we have mismatches, then they are far from the time sequence, then we have high cleavage frequency, okay? So if I have this data, then I can fit two functions to the samples. And then if a scientist now brings, gives me a, a DNA and RNA pair, then I can calculate the percent of similarity and the mismatches distance from the time, time and then I can say to which group it, uh, it belongs. And in this example, it would be a clip with high frequency. And now, since we, uh, we can uh, go one step ahead, and instead of saying, um, uh, doing categorical uh, classification, then I can actually predict the cleavage efficiency. I'll take a combination of the features, and now I want the cleavage efficiency, so I don't need the categories anymore. And now what I have to do is fit a regression line, a regression line to the samples, and according to that, predict the cleavage efficiency. But if you look at that, then we can say that um, low cleavages are underestimated. So in order to solve that, I can uh, split the x-axis to smaller intervals, and then fit the regression line to each part of the x-axis. And now uh, the um, blue samples are better fitted, and the others are better fitted, and we can go on and keep doing these splits in order to achieve uh, better and better uh, fitting. And now to uh, random forest regression. So we we'll talk here about decision trees. Uh, in random forest, we have uh, we have a forest of decision trees, and each decision tree is comp is uh, generated from a subset of the data and the features. For example, we have in the root all of the uh, samples, and then we have to select from a random set of the features one feature that uh, that divides the data to two uh, smaller groups. With uh, the most, uh, uh, with uh, the higher accuracy. So here we uh, we sample a subset of the features and use the best of them to split the data, and then we do this again in here and split the data until we reach the tips with very narrow distributions of the data, and when then we can fit a, um, a regression line to each of them. And actually, we have all of the features that divided the data in the nodes until we reach the tip. And these are the features that mostly affect this narrow distribution that reach, reach this tip, okay? And as, is, as I said, in random forest, we have a forest of trees. And actually, each tree is generated from a subset of the data. So we have a randomization uh, both on the samples and on the features. And eventually what we can achieve is not only the prediction of a sample. For example, if I have a new RNA and DNA pair here, I can compute the number of mismatches, then go right, then uh, the distance from the thumb, then go right, and until I reach the, uh, the tip that fits this pair, and uh, get the prediction of uh, uh, cleavage frequency. And another thing we can obtain from this forest is the importance of each feature. The times, uh, the number of times that the feature was selected in order to split the data, it represents the, uh, the, its importance for the prediction accuracy. Okay, so again, this is the data I have. Uh, and from the features, I use random forest to predict the observed cleavage frequency. Altogether, I had 32 sgRNAs, 700 cleaved sites, uh, 10,000 actually uncleaved sites, and about 80 features. And from this all, I devised CRISPR, CRISPR target assessment tool uh, that is av available online. And uh, we can use CRISPR in order to predict the, uh, the, the cleavage frequency or the cleavage probability for uh, a target of DNA by an RNA. So uh, what we can do with CRISPR is first of all predict the score. Then, if we um, if our scientists want to design the optimal RNA for this experiment, 
then you can look for off targets in the genome of reference um, and then find the uh, RNA sequence that is most suitable with actually with minimal number of uh, false positives of CRISPR. And another thing is uh, rank the targets inside a gene and select the target that is the most efficient for CRISPR. And how I checked the algorithm, so I did leave one sgRNA out cross validation. Um, in this cross validation procedure, I in each iteration I removed one uh, sgRNA and all of its DNA targets from the training set. I trained CRISPR over the rest of the data and then tried to predict uh, the uh, cleavage frequency of the test set. I did it over and over again across all these sets. And then eventually I have the observed cleavage frequency and the predicted one. When I have the two, what can I do? I can use it to calculate the uh, correlation between them. So uh, the correlation, uh, the average correlation of uh, Pearson R square is 80%. And compared to other tools that existed at this time, um, then uh, it was very high. So we had CCTOP, which was mostly used at that time, uh, with 20, uh, 22% and OPTD with 39%, and CFD score with 65% all over the same data, and CRISTA was uh, achieved 80%. So the question is, what made CRISTA more accurate? So yes, I used random forest, maybe the randomization or the, uh, the subsets or and maybe even more. But actually, um, there were another. There was another thing. Uh, if we look at the other tools, then they only look at mismatches between the RNA and DNA. So in this example, we have three mismatches. So each of them has a, a function that, according to the number of mismatches, they can compute the uh, the probability of cleavage. But as I told you before, we have a two meter long. Uh, genome and it is all folded into a little tiny cell. So what actually happens, we have here uh, the base pairs, the nucleotides, and they are inside the helix and this helix is folded uh, in, uh, uh, is folded in histone proteins and these are uh, folded uh, over nucleosomes and these are folded again into chromosomes so there are many folding inside, this, uh, inside the genome. And uh, think of it that when CRISPR has to uh, get to its location, to its target, then it also has to be open so it can reach it. And other tools didn't take this, uh, this, uh, um, um, this information into account. And in CRISTA, I used some features from online databases uh, to um, try to compute the uh, the folding in this position, in the position of, in the target position, where uh, CRISPR flew. Another thing about the structural elements, look at this pair of sgRNA DNA. This was clipped with very high efficiency. And we can see here that out of 20, uh, 20 nucleotides, we have 13 mismatches. Uh, and when you look at it, and you say 13 mismatches out of 20, how is it that, How is it even specific? Why do people call it the uh, CRISPR specific? And then afterwards, there was another study that showed that there may be bulges in the DNA or the RNA. And uh, what this means is that the most of the nucleotides are paired. <laughs> But there might be a little bulge that one nucleotide like fits outside, and in um, in this example, then uh, we'll we'll put first of all we'll put gaps uh, against the uh, these nucleotides in the other sequence uh, in the RNA or the DNA, and then we can lower the number of uh, of mismatches in this example from 13 to 3. So this is uh, a thing that was not uh, uh, cared for in the other algorithms, and they did not lo look at it. And once I, uh, I did a bioinformatic uh, algorithm called optimal pairwise alignment, 
Um, and I applied it to all of the uh, to all of the data set, and once I did that, the uh, correlation between the cleavage accuracy and uh, the number of mismatches was uh, was very much improved. So I also told you that um, random forest can give us the importance of features inside the forest, um, in uh, the very importance to the prediction ability. So what you see in this graph is every node is a feature. The size of the node is the feature importance. And the um, edges are, uh, the solid edges are, uh, means that they're uh, very highly correlated. So what we wanted to achieve here is uh, um, clusters of features with high, uh, and the sum of importance to the prediction ability. That means if we have two features that are very highly uh, correlated, then the importance would be split, would be divided between them. So we wanted to overcome this. Uh, I have here only the top features. So here, uh, the this cluster is a very similarity, which is very, uh, which is the most obvious one. Just a minute. And um, uh, these are features of the mismatches, the matches where the gaps are, the bulges, and, uh, and some others. Yes? Uh, how do you measure this correlation between features? Um, across the, the samples in my data set, in my database. I have all of the, the pairs of RNA and DNA. I have the, uh, for example, number of mismatches for each of them, and the distance from the time for each of them. I can, between the these two vectors, I can compare the, I can compute the correlation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the most obvious cluster, but they all also had a, a cluster of features that I call the DNA rigidity. What does this mean? So imagine that you're holding a, a pasta a stick in your hand, and now try to break it exactly in the middle. It can be easily done, right? So now cook the pasta and try again to break it exactly in the middle. It should be a little bit harder because the pasta is now cooked and you first have to stretch it and then get to the point in the middle. Now think to the other extreme that you have a metal rod in your hand. Now try to, put, to break it. You can do that. So this is, uh, this is the thing about DNA rigidity. If the DNA is too rigid, then CRISPR can't cleave it. But if it's too flexible, it's, uh, it is um, over nucleotides or folded uh, over itself, and CRISPR can't reach it. And in our database, we saw that CRISPR cleave targets that have DNA rigidity only in between. And this was a nice uh, observation from the data because it wasn't uh, observed before, it wasn't published before, and only afterwards uh, people have uh, examined that biologically and published, and it, it was a nice uh, validation of our data, of our analysis. And the third, the third CRISPR is the same DNA rigidity at the motif site, which also corroborates this observation. So, to sum up, actually, why is CRISPR? So first of all, we want to design uh, the optimal CRISPR experiment, uh, a target with RNA with high efficiency on the on target and low efficiency on the off target. Second, we can examine in the computer the features that could affect, uh, uh, affect CRISPR. That means that if, I, uh, if a scientist wants to develop a new CRISPR, uh, then he can check a feature that he believes that affects CRISPR, take this data, run the random forest, and see if it actually affects CRISPR. And the third thing is to compare CRISPR to alternative systems. So uh, there are some alternative uh, CRISPR systems like homo homologous uh, systems that were found in other bacteria or uh, bioengineered. And uh, we can use CRISPR or the algorithm behind it to compare the factors of different uh, mechanisms of different CRISPRs. And just a final note: um, 
these two, Emmanuel Chalfantia and Jennifer Dogner from UC Berkeley, they um, identified the whole machinery of CRISPR in 2012 in bacteria, and then they extracted CRISPR out and designed it to um, clean the bacteria, uh, our, the bacteria DNA. Then they uh, submitted uh, um, a patent over this thing. And the year afterwards, in 2013, uh, Feng Zhang uh, from the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, he used exactly, not exactly, but the same thing. He extracted uh, CRISPR from the bacteria and uh, altered it to, in order to infect a human genome cell. And uh, he also submitted the patent over it. And his patent, which was one year later, was uh, was accepted and not theirs. Now, uh, there was a, a kind of a, a war between them over the Nobel, Nobel Prize because it was believed that whoever, whoever has this patent will win the Nobel. And uh, in the beginning of this year, uh, um, uh, they applied to the, uh, uh, they appealed over the, uh, this uh, decision and uh, uh, the appeal was, uh, was uh, rejected and he actually got the patent in the end and it's believed now that he will win the Nobel uh, Prize. What's the explanation? Ah, sorry. Um, just a um, the explanation is that um, they can't take uh, take patent and uh, get patent over things that the nature nature does and what they showed is that. Uh, bacteria system works on bacteria system and he took the bacteria system and applied it to human cell. Mm -hmm. No, it's not from my So with this I would like to finish. Um, I worked with uh, um, a student of Feng Zhang, the guy with the patents, uh, mm -hmm. Winston Yang and uh, and uh, Didi from our university over the computational uh, algorithm. And uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Itang Ron and all my lab members. And thank you all for listening. on mice and they said that the, the mice with this uh, uh, mutation uh, showed better um, uh, they were uh, uh, more they were smarter or showed better skills of navigating or but it's mice so weird. <laughs> yeah but in the, in the mice case that there were uh, uh, mutation or uh, editing uh, so they didn't find any, but. Why embryos because of the quantity of the cells? So in embryos, you have, it depends on the stage, but one to four cells. And so you can, uh, every cell in our body has the same DNA. So if you do it in the, the basic cells, in the embryo cells, then all of the cells in the body will have the same DNA. Um, so in the yes, and we can do it in a grown man. In so you would request for the treatment for cancer or something like that? It's not possible for now. It should be local. Not You can't do it over the whole body. It should be local. Like if we talk so about the local, nervous system, it should local be local to what degree? Uh, to a small area in the yes. body to some subs. So there are, it should be to a smaller part of the body. Like for example, there are there are experiments to the nervous system, and then they do these experiments only in the brain, but it wasn't uh, allowed. It's not uh, FDA approved yet. Uh, I'm sorry, FDA approved yet. 
um, there are some others with the vision and, uh, and cancer cells. Yeah, the other question would be how specific can you get this treatment? Yes, so that's why they try the, the to do it very will local. Be for only one human and not jump for one human to the set. Yeah, it couldn't go from, it, it couldn't be infected from one person to the other. There are some problems with CRISPR, which should be first uh, solved or or minimized in order for it to be FDA approved for some uh, treatments. It's also not, not uh, hereditary, right? It's, no, it's not a yeah, because it's uh, in the cell that doesn't go to your baby. Okay, thank you everyone.